One in 10,000 children are born with a brain malformation known as Dandy Walker syndrome. Dandy Walker can cause enlargement of the skull, lack of muscle control, and other developmental challenges. More research is needed, but we do know that early therapy helps many live healthier, fuller lives. One in 10,000 may not seem like a lot, unless your child is the one. Learn more, find help, and help others. Visit dandy-walker.org. Hello, everybody, and welcome into another edition of Train Talks. My name is Sean Salehi, and this time I am joined by Big Train 2018 and 19 catcher Jacob Southern out of Jacksonville University and now transferring to Indiana University. Jacob, how you doing, buddy? I'm doing good, man. Doing good. Well, Jacob is back home in Florida. Clearly, there's a lot of things going on in the country. That's why we can't be in person today. But I wanted to talk to you about a uh, little bit about your time here in Bethesda, the not just last year, but the year before that as well. And then also, uh, you had to face a little bit of adversity last year and then make it over a hump through the summer and into mm -hmm. this year. And it's led to a lot of cool things uh, for your baseball career going forward. So we'll jump right into it. Uh, first of all, right. first of all, you go to Jacksonville, uh, local Florida kid, uh, ranked in the top 300 players in the country and all American in high school. And you come to Jacksonville and you end up, you know, making a mark pretty early on and, and you start getting behind the plate more and more as games go on. When did you start really feeling comfortable, uh, playing for the Dolphins? Um, Probably like the fall of my sophomore year, I had a big, big adjustment to make my freshman year. Like, I think I had the talent my freshman year. I just didn't, um, I didn't adjust well to the, to the level of play in college baseball. Um, I really, I really settled in freshman or sophomore fall. And I think I, I feel like I had a pretty good sophomore season. Yeah. I mean, that I definitely think that's yeah. fair to say. You started <laughs> forty out of forty-eight <laughs> games that you played in, and I mean, yeah. you know, slash two thirty-one. So led the team in, or had a tie for the team uh, lead in home runs and uh, and slugging percentage. So there's two parts of, for people who aren't familiar with your game of your game that I recognized immediately. Uh, <laughs> that you have the most fun doing. One is hitting bombs, and two is throwing people out. Uh, yeah, from behind the plate. Fun. So, well, clearly, yeah. I mean, no, who doesn't <laughs> like to hit hit home runs or, or get guys guns? So, I mean, you're a very competitive guy, and I know you have a lot of fun doing both, but I wanted to ask you, which one do you enjoy doing more? Oh, man, I guess it depends on the situation, honestly. Um, uh like if it's if it's a close, I mean, yeah, that's a hard one, dude. Okay, so would you rather throw out like, would you rather throw out a, you know, really good base runner, or hit a home run off a really good pitcher? I'd rather throw out a really good base runner. Why? Just because like he like homeboy thinks he's fast, and like he no like he knows he's fast. I know he's fast, um, and I just I. I think it's a little more satisfying because it doesn't like I know neither of them happen a lot but like I feel like throwing a guy out happens less often it, nah, I mean well it depends on who it I'm is not, I'm not saying you... home runs come I'm not saying home runs come easy yeah but I don't know I feel like it's a little more satisfying throwing uh throwing guys out that makes sense I mean you threw a lot of guys out going into your junior year at Jacksonville you had a career high. I mean, you threw out 20 guys trying to steal a base against you. When, when did you finally kind of figure out that timing when it came to just the transfer, catching the ball, and, and uh, you know, watching the guy, let's just say it's second, because that's probably where most of them happen is at second. Mm -hmm. uh, when do you kind of really start feeling like, okay, I have this rhythm down and I have complete faith that I'll get him out? Um. I mean, it's all just muscle memory. I've thrown, I've thrown the ball down to second so many times. But like when I was younger, I didn't have the strongest arm. So what I really worked on was like quick feet and get rid of the ball really quick. 
So when my body finally caught up, like my arm caught up, I kind of had to slow my body down. And that was one of the transitions I had to make my freshman year and like going into my sophomore year was kind of slowing my transition down and not really thinking I'm going to get rid of the ball as quick as possible, but like I'm going to get rid of it quick, but also have something behind it. So, and that, that really helped. Yeah. And like you said, muscle memory definitely plays a factor. In fact, one of my favorite videos that we did last year over the summer oh, was the man. Adley Rushman challenge where we literally had you blindfolded. Oh, like this? Yeah. I can see through my hat. Can you? Yeah. All right, hold still. Were you, did you think I could see through that? I wasn't sure. God dang. <laughs> I can't even breathe. Am I, am I lined up? You're lined up. Ow. Coach O showed me that video. Um, it was like a week or two after Rushman got drafted. He showed me that video. I was like, that can't, I literally, I said, that can't be that hard. I really don't, I really feel like that's not hard. And he said, I'm going to hold you to that. We're going to try that this summer. I was like, all right, let's do it. And then we had a couple hours before one of the games at, um, at DC. And he was like, you want to do it? I was like, yeah, sure. Why not? Let's do it. <laughs> why not? Perfect so, throw. I mean, <laughs> tried it and it was fun. Yeah, I mean, that was that was probably one of my favorite videos that we had. <laughs> you got right up behind you, and you literally were saying, I, I can't see, uh, so I just tell me if this goes into right field. And it was, it was a perfect dart. Um, mm -hmm. One thing that, I mean, it, it was, I, I think it should be prefaced that the way that you and I first interacted, I think is hilarious, because I would, oh, always, yeah. go, I would always go down uh, and watch batting practice BP with uh, to just watch you know especially especially early on in the season who's got who's got some pop in their bat what how guys are swinging you know what's their rhythm stuff like that and I remember I went down maybe the first two or three exhibit two exhibition games like first game of the season and you had never said a word to me I had never said a word to you and uh, other than maybe the occasional like what's up <laughs> and, uh, and you eventually just come over and just like Hey man, I'm like this is really awkward. So I'm just gonna introduce myself and break the ice. I'm Jacob. <laughs> like, yeah, we we just kept making that eye contact because I was just like I was like trying to figure out who this guy is because he's definitely not a player. He's not no. unit up. Like trying to figure out who this guy is. And luckily, uh, luckily it wasn't bad enough of a first impression that he came through the rest of the way. But uh, it was. I, you know, it was it was really cool getting to know you and all the other guys on the team, and there was a mm -hmm. real chemistry uh, between all of the guys that you had uh, on that 2019 squad. There were five players that had mm -hmm. returned from the previous summer that you had already gotten to meet, but tell me about kind of how, especially during summer ball, you got to gel with these players that you had never played with before. So, um, actually, one of my, like, best friends right now, uh, Logan Barker, yeah. he uh, – he so we played against each other during the season obviously he went to liberty but his first day there he showed up like a couple of weeks like i think a week or two after me because he made it they won the conference <laughs> they made it to a regional um he showed up and i was like hey man jacob southern he was like yeah i know you I, I, I went to liberty i was like oh okay how you doing he's like yeah you hit a home run off me i was like oh <laughs> hi <laughs> and it was just I, I don't know what happened but we clicked and we became best friends after that like we have not stopped talking since that's awesome. I mean, how, like, obviously there's uh, an important baseball factor into summer ball and just trying to grow your game and improve, whether it be in the field or uh, in the batter's box. And, but there's also the, you know, factor that you're living sometimes with these guys and mm -hmm. those families and you're together every day, yeah. usually, uh, you know, out there for hours on end with these guys and for the big train case, working summer camp early in the morning, mm -hmm. working out together. So there, there's a real important factor of having chemistry as well. Yeah, I um, so I was really close with Kobe too. We um, because he lived like a minute or two away from me. He didn't have a car, so I drove him every single day. We went to the gym every uh, together all the time. We did pretty much everything together because he didn't have a car. So, um, but yeah, the we were definitely like a close knit family. We were all brothers, like. In, instantly brothers I don't think there was really anybody that had a problem with anybody that I knew of at least and then you have one of the most charismatic coaches when you get to know him Sal oh Sal dude. explain explain for people who don't know Sal like you know him or like I know him uh to 
people, yeah, I wouldn't have ever guessed the guy that is kind of underneath the, you know, the, the stern face and, and, and stoic look. <laughs> He's a clown, man. Like he's <laughs> he's definitely a character. He um he'll like he'll give you some crap like every single day, but you know that he's not like actually mad at you ever. And it's it honestly it it helps us get through summer ball because like everybody's away from home. Like we're everybody's kind of iffy when you first get there. Like I'll admit my first my first week there, the first the one of the first things Sal ever said to me was um. We were taking BP, and I was like, hey, do we need to wear cleats for BP? And um, he was like, you can if you want. And I was like, yeah, sure, why not? So I busted out, like, these brand-new pair of cleats that I got from Ross for, like, 15, 20 bucks. <laughs> and he's like, are you wearing brand-new cleats right now? <laughs> and I was like, I mean, yeah. <laughs> and he just kind of, he kind of, like, gave me some crap for it, and I thought it was pretty funny. But it was, he's, he's great. He, he's got every player's best interest at heart. He doesn't. He doesn't have like a secret agenda or anything. He loves he loves all of us like we're his son. And I mean, clearly you have a close relationship with with Sal and with the mm-hmm. players that you that you played with here in Bethesda. But you also got a chance to make you know some lifelong friends in terms of the host families that you had mm-hmm. as well. And just I wanted I was wondering if you could kind of touch on some of the incredible people that you got to meet during your two years up here. Yeah. So I lived with um, the Fletchers my second year uh, because I kind of spent, I spent a lot of time with Grayson my first year there. Um, Cause he was a catcher too. And he wanted me to like show him some stuff, teach him a little bit. And I asked him, I was like, Hey, if I come back next year, can I live with you? Cause one, it's closer to you. Like you're pretty cool. I like your family. Um, so I lived with them the second summer and it was, it was awesome. I loved it. Um, they took me to a couple of Nats games. We went and saw some like some monuments and stuff on off days. The dad was a chef. It was awesome. Sounds like the uh, whole package. Yeah. And then my first year I lived with uh, Miss Crowley, Becky, and she, um, she was awesome. She did everything for us. Like it was a little bit of a hike of a drive every day to the field, but I didn't have a problem with it. Like I don't mind driving. She, um, she was absolutely awesome though. She actually still, her and my mom still keep in contact. It was just awesome. I loved every single family that I met there was just absolutely amazing. Well, that's awesome. Cause the, you know, the family aspect of big train is such a big part mm-hmm. of, of summer ball in general, but also especially the organization uh, that we have going on up here. So I'm happy that you still feel that connection with oh, some of the play, uh, families that you've had and, you know, the players that you've also gotten the chance to play with. So now let's dive in to last season. I remember meeting you, talking to you day one. We, I kind of asked you like, Hey, what, what's your game like this, that or the other. And you told me flat out, I mean, I'm a power, I'm a power hitter. Um, but I like to hit for uh, hit for average as well. I mean, it, you know, I, I would prefer to rather have a high batting average than a lot of home runs and strike out all the time. And, you know, that's something that is you kind of expect to hear. Like, yeah. hey, I hit bombs, but I'm not trying to hit bombs. <laughs> um, but it was real. I mean, you you right off the bat were smacking balls all over the field. And for the longest time, leading the league in batting average and then the home runs came along with it was there ever I mean just kind of a focus like hey you know if this one gets out it's it it is what it is but I'm really just trying to put it in play or I mean did you make an adjustment in terms of just summer ball or is this just something that carried over from college I think that like at least this summer it kind of carried over through my second half of my junior year um I feel like I had a pretty good second half of uh, college ball. And it's just, it was never like, hey, I'm hitting a home run this at bat or like, I'm like, I need to hit a home run this game or whatever. It was just, it was all about finding barrel. And I mean, if it went far enough, it went far enough. Well, one of the farthest (laughs) balls I've ever seen hit was uh, against Gaithersburg. Funny enough, the same game where there was a combined no hitter, uh, thrown by the Bethesda big train. It was a 10 nothing final score against Gaithersburg at home. And it was in the sixth inning. You came up the uh, runner on first. I think, oh, actually it was Kobe. He stole second. And you come up to the plate and send an absolute shot into the top of the trees. <laughs> like, I, I remember. Have, I have still I never that. seen a ball hit there. And you told me a couple of games later when you came up and joined 
uh, the booth that that was the nicest swing feeling swing that you had had mm -hmm. in your baseball career. Uh, I do remember I that. Ask, have that have it, has, has anything superseded that yet? Or is that still? Absolutely that's still not. Absolutely not. <laughs> what is, what is the feeling? I mean, for when you hit a home run, is it, do you feel a lot more of the ball with your bat or do you not feel it as much? You definitely don't feel it as much. Like with the, it's, it's kind of weird. Like the better contact you make, you feel it less on the barrel. It just like, cause like you, I guess it's easier to explain when, when you don't make good contact, it like rattles the bat a little bit, especially with a wood bat. Like if you don't make solid contact, it kind of like, you definitely feel that. But if you make, if you hit it perfectly on the barrel, it's like, I don't, I don't know. You don't, there's, there's no like repercussions. I don't, I don't know for, for lack of better words. It's just fluid. Yeah, it's it's super fluid. Yeah, that's a that's a better word. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, there was that that was a fluid swing for sure. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, it was home run after home run after home run. You had only hit five, only hit five the summer before, and you were sitting at eight going into uh, the All Star break and and you know the midway point of this past summer. And mm -hmm. now things are going to get a little bit serious. Uh, we, we go down to North Carolina, and there's, they're part of the Southern Collegiate Showcase. And you, as a Cal Ripken League All-Star, represent the Ripken League and head down to Cary, North Carolina with the rest of the guys from all the other teams in the Cal Ripken League to play against teams or the best players in the Sun Belt League and uh, I believe it was the Gulf Coast League. And, mm -hmm. you know, we show up, beautiful facility for USA Baseball in Cary, North Carolina. Definitely. There's scouts, uh, you know, this is an opportunity for guys, truth be told, especially in like leagues like uh, the Sunbelt League, the Ripken League, all these other leagues that don't get scouts as prevalent as you see in like up there in the Cape. So this is a big chance for, for players to shine. And in the first game, you have an opportunity to make that happen uh, with behind the plate, guys trying to steal second and you throw them out. However, when you're going back to the dugout, I remember something wasn't right, and you ended up not coming back in the game. It turns out that there was a partial UCL tear in your elbow on that throw. First of all, I just want to ask you, what is going through your head when that play happens? And, and you know, kind of walk me through what ended up going down the rest of that evening. So, when the, so like, my arm had been bothering me for a little bit the last couple of days, but I didn't really think too much of it because I've like I've had arm soreness before. I thought it was just normal. Um but it was a it was a little bit more than what I was used to. Um and so the kid stole and I felt a pop in my elbow on the throw. But like it was a good throw. Like you said, I got him out. And I did so I was like I was like, hey maybe it's nothing. <laughs> Hopefully it's nothing. I just kinda like tried not to think about it. Um and then that inning ended without me having to make a throw another throw I went out to hit the next inning and uh it was stinging while I um it was it stung when I swung the bat and I just kind of told myself that's yeah, probably not good but hey I got six innings to catch we'll catch those innings and then we'll figure it out after the game um and then I went out to catch the next inning and I went to make that throw like the throw down in between innings and I kind of braced myself. I was like, hey, this is probably going to hurt a little bit. But like I said, I got six innings and we're going to get out of here. Um, I threw the ball and it was one of the worst pains I've ever felt in my life. It kind of felt like like there was a knife stuck in my elbow. And I was trying to throw a baseball with a knife in my elbow. Um, and so yeah, I went and I uh, dropped down to a knee. And then Christy came out and they got me back to the dugout. And uh I kind of put my head in a towel for about two, two or three innings. And um, then there was a rain delay. And that's kind of when I started like moving around and stuff and I uh, called my mom and all that, let her know, that, <laughs> let her know that I wasn't dead. Cause all she heard was, yeah. Um, all she heard was silence for like a minute on the broadcast. And then, uh, sorry about that. Uh, catcher Jacob Southern has been uh, removed from the game and she just started, she told me she was freaking out. Yeah, that um, was, it was, I guess it was, it was mostly because we were confused. It was. No, yeah, no, I'm, I'm not, I'm not blaming you. Oh no, yeah, all. of course not. But it was just, I mean, yeah, it was, it was a confusing situation yeah. to where you threw the guy out, things seem okay. You come back up to bat, things seem okay. And then you come back in between innings and that's where the problem was. So that, 
that was why there was the confusion. And, um, yeah. and I remember specifically, uh, it was me and it wasn't my normal broadcast partner, Alex Drain. We actually had one of my our writers, Aaron, come down with us. And I remember we, you know, muted the mics and talked and like, okay, well, we haven't experienced this before. There wasn't, there wasn't an injury, uh, all season, you know, thank mm-hmm. God, uh, on either side of any game that we had covered. So we were just trying to kind of toe the line a little bit. You never want to speculate. And, uh, I just remember thinking like, God, this is, this, this is a, a not great situation considering yeah. the circumstances. And I mean, I can imagine for you, there's got to be so many different kinds of emotions rushing through your head because it's not like this is happening at Shirley Povich field. This is happening at a showcase event. Mm-hmm. It wasn't, I wasn't really thinking like, Oh my gosh, that just happened in front of so many scouts. It was more like I was extremely worried that I'd never play baseball again like I was worried that that was going to be the end of my career and that was like like I said the first two or three innings I just kind of had my head in the towel and uh I didn't really move I was sitting at the end of the dugout um I gave I I literally called I like I because uh I gave Christy my mom and dad's phone number for them for her to call them and they didn't they didn't answer because obviously they don't know Christy's phone number so I get I grabbed my phone out of my bag I hit call and I handed the phone to Christy and like a couple minutes later she came back and wanted to like she's like your mom is asking if she can talk to you I was like no all right no no I'll, I'll call her back later I just I I wasn't in the mood to explain anything I just kind of needed to I don't know if be alone with my own thoughts was the right word but I was those first couple innings I was seriously worried that I would never be able to play baseball again completely understandable I mean you you as a baseball player, know better than most. As if you feel something in your elbow, it, the worst case scenario is is Tommy John. And this mm-hmm. is you're a player who's entering in the fall of your senior season, and you want to make the best impression. Mm-hmm. So I can completely understand where you're coming from in terms of the worry of is this the last time I ever you know mm-hmm. hold baseball again, uh, and will I ever get a chance to redeem myself? And I, I remember getting a chance to talk to you and you you were able to go to the doctors and, and things ended up not being as bad as yeah. previously thought. Tell me what the feeling was when you get the results back that, you know, it's only a part, I mean, it's still a tear, but it's a partial tear mm-hmm. compared, and, and surgery will not be required. So we were sitting under the pavilion at Shirley Povich. Um, Sal was making his lineup and stuff and I was reading the PDF report and I got to the part that said uh uh it, the the medical term was um moderate ucl sprain with proximal fraying and what the doctor told me is that fraying meant partial tear but i was just so excited that it wasn't fully torn i started like i was like pounding my fist on the um on the uh on the picnic table and sal was like stop bro you're gonna hurt your arm more and i was like i'm fine Okay, don't I like I'm happy right now. This is good. Um, uh, and I was just I was I called uh, I called my mom, told her that that's what it was. I called my two coaches at JU and told them it was just a partial tear and that I wasn't going to need surgery. Um, it was just I. It was definitely like best case scenario, um, and I was I was pretty happy. So completely understandable. I mean, that's that's the best news that you can possibly hope for at that point. Because I mean, there, let's be honest. There's, it's not like it isn't injured, so you can't expect it yeah. to come back. Exactly. Like it, something's definitely wrong. <laughs> yeah. So it was it was best case scenario, and you know, due to precautions, you end up deciding to go home. Understandable. Go yeah. home, get treatment, go to the facility, uh, get things right. But the impact that you had had was on the team was significant. And uh, first of all, you and Matt Thomas uh, were in a heated (laughs) RVI chase for who was going to have the crown. And Matt Thomas ended up having the final laugh. He finished with 40. You had 33. Um, Wait, he only had had 34? uh, I believe it. Well, no, he finished with 40. Oh, 40. I was going to say, if he only beat me by one, come on, dude. No, he finished with 40. So, okay. yeah, I mean, it was a heated battle. You were also leading the home run uh, chase at that time. You know, 
he ended up only losing that battle by one home run. Scotty Morgan mm-hmm. had nine, you had eight. So I, I, I told, I told Scotty, I was like, I was like, hey, if if you're cool, you'll let me keep this home run title. <laughs> and literally the next day, he hit two home runs in one game. I was like, <laughs> come on, man, let me have something. Well, you ended up having a lasting impact with the team in that they used your batting helmet mm-hmm. as kind of a rallying cry. Uh, for them and it was a team that needed a rally in order to come back and win in one of the most epic fashions uh, that any of us could have possibly imagined in eighth inning uh, come back down you know 6-0 end up or 4-0 end up winning 6-4 and the guy to hit the home run to really spark the offense is none other than Matt Thomas mm-hmm. who had not hit a home run all season or in his college career so it was a really, really cool moment. And I remember they would all hold up your helmet when they came back to the mm-hmm. dugout as if you were there as well, giving them fist bumps. When you hear that they are treating you this way and remembering you this way, even though you're a couple thousand miles away at home, how much does that mean to you? It, it meant the absolute world. Cause I, I was very, I was so upset that I couldn't be there to finish the season with them. Um, it just it it meant everything. It put a smile on my face. Every single picture that I got, every single text that I got about it, it was awesome. Yeah, I mean, it was it was an inspiring story to continue to follow, and it was a really cool tribute. I thought the the way that they honored you the rest of that uh, postseason mm-hmm. all culminated with them putting your bucket on top of the trophy uh, on that final championship game. So that was really cool. But now mm-hmm. you know we gotta we gotta focus on. Okay, what's the next step? This is now you trying to get back going into your senior season to get a chance to play baseball. I mean, this is a quick turnaround for that kind of injury. What was the process on a day-to-day basis for you to just go through rehab and try to get things right for the spring? So we we went the um, rest and rehab route right away because uh, a PRP injection just um, it wasn't in the cards at the time with my family and so I got to about I'd say probably 75 80 percent healthy um, with just rest and rehab and then it kind of flared up on me again it started bothering me so I shut down for I think two days and then I tried hitting and throwing again and it just it still felt bad so we uh, got the PRP injection about a week before Thanksgiving and that was a that was a six week um, shutdown from the date of the injection, and then like so six weeks after the injection, I was able to I was allowed to start throwing and hitting again. But then six weeks from that was opening weekend, so I was like, yo, I have six weeks to get this arm ready to play baseball. Um, and we kind of we kind of rushed through it because I mean I'm a senior. I wanted to play my senior year. I didn't yeah. want to miss any games so I rushed to be ready for the um ready for opening weekend and like I was I was fine to play it was just I wasn't I wasn't strong I wasn't the same player if that if that makes any sense yeah absolutely and was it which which was more uncomfortable for you to to ask uh is was it was it the hitting factor or the throwing factor uncomfortable as in pain or uncomfortable as in like hard we can just wait. We can, I mean, either one, honestly, I mean, cause you're, you're trying to get back to a hundred percent, which one felt like it was more of a challenge for you to get back to where you felt before the injury. Was it behind the plate uh, and, and doing everything that you could defensively or was it, you know, offensively? I would probably say offensively. Cause I missed like, I don't know, seven months of at bat of I've seen live pitch. I didn't get anything in the fall. I was I was actually one day away from getting to see live pitching. Oh wow. Oh, I had to shut down. Reason I was still kind of working through it. I got to a really bad start. I I'll tell you what, if I couldn't laugh about it, I don't know what I would have done. But it was I got to a bad start. Um we, we, but I figured I started to figure out before everything got shut down. Well, yeah, um, I was going to say, we can luckily can laugh about it now. And I yes, mean, exactly. it, was, it was the way it, I mean, in a, in a sense, it was almost deja vu for you because the, the previous spring at, at JU, you had struggled pretty severely early on, but you ended up really cranking it up 
mm -hmm. in the back half of the season. And that was kind of the same here. Granted, there were different circumstances that clearly could have led to that kind of early season struggle for you. But the back half of the season, certainly the last five games, you had hits, a five-game hit streak um, going into that shutdown when things came down. Was it frustrating for you to – feel like, man, yet again, it's just a, another kind of season that I'm not getting things rolling early on. Kind, I mean, yeah, it was frustrating, but I tried not to put too much pressure on myself because I knew, I knew it was because I hadn't seen at-bats. I hadn't seen live pitching in so long. So, like, I, I knew it would come, but it was just like, like, hey, when's it going to come? Like, I knew, I knew we would get there, but I want, I wanted to be there. If that, I mean, obviously, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And, um, then the shoe drops, COVID happens. I mean, we were all affected in different ways. I'm, I was a sports journalism major at Arizona State covering spring training, and it started with, okay, you're not allowed to be in the clubhouse anymore. Okay, now you can be outside the clubhouse to ask questions, but you got to be six feet away. Okay, now there's not going to be fans in the stadium, and okay, now there's not going to be any games. So tell me, I mean, because when it comes to ba uh, college baseball, it was a lot more of just – the shoe dropped. There wasn't really kind of a gradual decline in terms of, okay, will things go this way? Where were you when you heard the final decision that uh, there wasn't going to be any more games this spring? And how did you react? So that week in general was kind of like a roller coaster. So the Wednesday of that week was the day that we were playing Yale that Wednesday. And it was the day that the Ivy League said that they were because the Ivy League was the first uh conference to say we're not doing this anymore we're shutting yeah. down um so it was about two hours before our game started two two and a half um but they said that we could play our game since they were already there and so we played that game and then we kind of thought Thursday we were worried Thursday was gonna be our last practice so we tried to make it like a fun practice kind of um and then Thursday night the Atlantic Sun conference the conference that Jay used in said that they were um, suspending play until April 5th, um, but that we can still practice. So, like, we went – so, we're like, okay. So, like, we'll, we'll play in April. We'll play April, May. Um, we figured out then. So, we went to practice on Friday, and we knew that the NCAA was meeting about what they, what they were going to decide with the season during our practice. And we knew that they had come out with a decision. We had, we had an inner squad um, during the inner squad, but our coach didn't tell us until after. He then – obviously, they – canceled the entire season um but he said he found out in like the second or third inning of the inner squad but he didn't want to he wanted us to finish out as a team but um it was definitely kind of kind of a smack in the face uh yeah smack in the face um because I didn't really I didn't there wasn't any talk about eligibility relief so I was like did my senior season really just end after 18 games um so I kind of sat in the locker room for probably four hours after practice, which I don't normally do. I usually, I shower, put my clothes on, and I get out of there. Um, it was just, I, I, I don't know. It was so many thoughts going through my mind. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure it was an emotional roller coaster for you, just considering, again, the, the recent success you had had uh, on the diamond and things were start, far, start, finally starting to be put together for you. And, you know, Yet again, another roadblock ends up making mm -hmm. you think, is this the last time I hold a baseball again? And so um, what were kind of the conversations that you were having with friends, family, and coaches when it came to, you know, or, or I mean, were there thoughts that like, is this is the end? And then things kind of started getting back in the right direction? Or were you like, no, this is, you know what, this is really going to, we're going to make sure, even if this is the last time at JU, I'm going to give everything I can to try to train and potentially see if I can sign uh, down the line. Um, so I definitely, like, I definitely wanted to keep playing. I just, uh, when there was finally talk about, like, eligibility, el eligibility relief, um, I kind of, I had this thought in my head that I didn't want to go back to Jacksonville. Um, I kind of I played my four years there. I did my did my time, so to speak. Um, I kind of wanted like a change of scenery, and um, so I uh, I was talking to um, a 
one of the JU coaches who was getting a head coaching job at a D2 in South Carolina. And he was like, hey, come with me. Like, I know, like, I know you don't want to come back to Jacksonville um, and you're not sure what you're going to do. He said, hey, come with me. Like, we're going to have a blast. We're going to do good. And I was like, all right, sure, fine, dude, whatever. That's perfectly fine by me. Like, I love you as a coach. I completely trust you. And so I put my name in the portal, the transfer portal, thinking it was just going to be like a formality type thing. And then just all these, all these different schools started messaging me and emailing me and texting me and calling me. And one of them happened to be um, Indiana University. And I was like, wait, like this is, this is a big 10, like top 25, power five conference. Like this is the Indiana University. And they just, I talked to the pitching coach. So the pitching coach at Indiana used to coach at UCF. Um, so he knew me before. And when he saw my name in the portal, um, he reached out to me instantly. And so we talked a couple times. And then I talked to the head coach. And um, next thing I know, I was committed to Indiana. <laughs> I was going to I was gonna ask, I mean, was it – were there a lot of different talks with other teams? I mean, what, it, it's almost like entering free agency in a sense. You, you kind of have control over your own destiny. And almost – I guess a better, a better way to put it, it's, it's like getting recruited all over again. And, <laughs> exactly. I was – it was so like – overwhelming is a good way to put it. Like, I was like, I feel like I'm a junior in high school all, all over again. I was like, I'm going through this again. This is insane. I didn't want to do this again. Um, but uh, it was, it was fun. Like as, as overwhelming as it was, it was really fun. Well, I mean, again, and it also has to be, you know, rewarding in a sense uh, to, to think, wow, I put in so much effort to make sure I came back and had another chance at playing the sport I love and seeing that, Hey, there's people who are paying attention to what I have done at Jacksonville and at a sun uh, conference that I didn't think people were watching me. So that has to really kind of feel rewarding for you to know that you had that kind of recognition from schools outside of just oh, the, corner of the Southeast. A hundred percent. It felt, I, I, I was really like, is this like, this is like a, top school and they they want me to come play for them and I was like dang <laughs> this is this is happening well I know you're so excited to get to Bloomington and you know work out and stuff like that and 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 you know put on the red and white but I have to ask did you even like get a chance to look at the school in person I mean there was no traveling or anything so did they give you like a virtual tour what what's the case here yeah the the coach the head coach sent me to sent me a link to the virtual tour of the campus and of the facilities and like they sent me a couple pictures and videos and all that but I mean honestly I like it's I didn't really need to see any of that I knew there's no fear of being catfished here exactly <laughs> exactly um I just kind of knew what was going to happen so I didn't really need to see all that kind of stuff. That wasn't really going to be the selling point for me. So what was the selling point? Was it to get more eyes on you to potentially make the jump to the next level? Or was it, Hey, I just want to, I want to play somewhere where I feel like I'll get, you know, a lot of playing time and have a chance to make an impact. The second one um, okay. that have, have playing time and make a real impact because they, they they won the Big Ten last year. They won the conference, and so they're definitely reaching for reaching for higher this year. Um, and if they they felt like I can make a, a good contribution to that, and um, they're really big on player development there, and like really analyzing every single part about your game. And I'm really excited to get up there and like hone in on certain things that I haven't been able to hone in on yet. Well. I, uh, one final thing on this is you've, you're a Florida boy, right? born and oh, raised. Okay. You, you, I already know where this is going. You stayed, you've stayed in the Florida area your entire life. How was it going to be to now have to make a move? I mean, it was eventually going to happen sometime in life, clearly. There's mm -hmm. hardly anybody nowadays who stays in one place their entire lives. But you've told me that you don't get a chance to travel too much. Baseball always got in the way. How mm -hmm. How was – this next challenge how are you approaching this next challenge of having to you know go to a whole different different state in a different environment in the midwest um i mean i'm I, i'm excited i don't really care how far away from home it is like it staying close to home was never like a huge 
huge deal to me. Like, yeah, it was nice that I was only two hours away um, being in Jacksonville. But um, that wasn't, like, a driving point in the recruiting process. But uh, <laughs> I'm kind of worried about the cold. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> like, I, I, I say that I like the cold, but I, don't, I know that I don't know real cold. Because, I mean, I've never even seen snow, man. Like, Really? Yeah. So the closest Ever. I've come – the closest I've come to seeing snow was sophomore year. At, we were playing at Lipscomb. It was 32 degrees at game time, and it was flurrying. But it wasn't, stick, it wasn't sticking to the ground, so I didn't count it. I don't count that as seeing snow. It's BS. Um, You'll see snow in Bloomington. Oh, yeah, I will. And um, I'm nervous, but I'm, I'm excited at the same time. Don't worry. Just, just trust me. It, it's like when I went to Arizona State. You don't kind of – you know that you're getting into something you haven't experienced before. In my case, it was 110 degrees. Um, but there's nothing that can really prepare you for it other than the fact that you have to know, in your case, bring a lot of layers. And uh -huh. it's just, I mean, it's like the Florida heat. You just don't go outside. So it's yep, pretty much pretty much the same thing. Um, unless you're a kid, I always love playing in the snow. Uh, so who knows? Maybe you get to have that, that kid-like experience at 22, 23. But yeah. <laughs> Jacob, thank you so much for taking the time though, to talk. This has been awesome. Your story is one of the most inspiring that I've been a chance I've had a chance to know and follow. And you know it's all love over here, brother. I can't wait to see what mm -hmm. you do at Indiana and then moving on to the next level. Thank you, man. I really appreciate that. Thank yeah, you. Absolutely. That'll do it for this edition of Train Talks for everything else you want that's related to the Bethesda Big Train. Keep it right here on Big Train TV.